So good afternoon. Welcome to the Museum of the Abramoff. We are delighted to have everyone with us today. Um, just um, a quick reminder, we're going to ask everyone to please either mute or turn off your cell phones. Um, also, too, we would like to remind everyone that our next History for Lunch is scheduled for Wednesday, March the 6th at noon, featuring Dr. Cynthia A. Kerner, Professor of History at George Mason University. She will discuss her newest book, The Troy's Wife, A Woman and Her Family in Revolutionary America. The engrossing book tells the story of Jane Welburn Spurgeon, a patriot who welcomed General Nathaniel Green to her home and aided Continental forces while her loyalist husband was fighting for the king as an officer in the Troy militia. Dr. Kerner will show how the revolution not only toppled long-established political hierarchies, but also strained family ties and drew women into the public sphere to claim both citizenship and rights. But today, we would like to welcome Adair Raybon, park ranger from Fort Raleigh National Historic Site. She will provide you insight into how Roanoke Island was a place of community for thousands of freedom seekers during the Civil War with the establishment of a freedman's colony. So I would like to welcome Mrs. Ray Ms. Rayburn. Thank y'all so much. Good afternoon and welcome. Um, what I'd really like to do is talk to y'all today about the Roanoke Island Freeman's Colony. Now with the National Park Service, this is one of many stories that we tell at Fort Raleigh National Historic Site. You may be familiar with um, a really popular one, the, you know, the kind of the legend of the lost colony of the 1580s and Sir Walter Raleigh. But recently, we've really been dedicated to telling stories that people may not have heard before. So that's why we're really bringing light to these voices of the Freedman's Colony. And we give public programming at least once a day in the summer about the Freedman's Colony. And what we really like that to be is a dialogue between our visitors and our Park Service Rangers, our interpreters, because that when we're having that conversation together, that is a place of learning. And during our programs, we have a few things, a few kind of non-negotiables that we like to stick to. Um, one is making place for dialogue. Understanding American history helps us understand the present. And we want to build that visibility of the people's voices who haven't traditionally been heard. We have a bunch of values that we stick to, honesty, sharing facts, speaking openly, testing assumptions, um, sharing the whole story with multiple perspectives, knowing that it may engender discomfort in some of us. We recognize the lives of those who were enslaved on Roanoke Island and those who lived in the Freedmen's Colony, and we treat them with respect, humanity, empathy, and agency. We are committed to accountability, so supporting each other in these experiences with training, research, and empathy. There are a few non-negotiables that we stand by. Um, the first is that slavery was the primary cause of the Civil War. The Confederacy went to war to preserve the institution of chattel slavery. Individual Confederate soldiers, however, may have enlisted for various reasons. We know that enslaved people experienced agency in various ways within the institution of enslavement, but there is no such thing as a good master because there is no good aspect of owning people. We know that race was used race was used as justification for chattel slavery in the United States. And we know that systematic oppression in the US is rooted in that system of race-based chattel slavery and the legacy of enslavement in this country. We know that visitors will always, always, always be heard. We welcome open dialogue, but Confederate supporting ideas will not be validated because they contradict those key truths and those ideals. Another thing I wanted to touch on before we get started was language. Language is always evolving and has evolved even from the time I've been in the park service. So these are some things we're dedicated to. We say enslaved person instead of slave. And we wanna make sure that personhood is given to these people. We say enslaver or slaveholder instead of master or owner. The use of the word owner um, implies objects and people are not objects. We say torture rather than discipline. And we tell the truth of freedom seekers, not runaways, escapees, or fugitives. There are negative connotations to those words. We use contraband with historical context, not to refer to people. And we say African-American or Black when we know the preference of the person that we're speaking to or about. So now let's get started with a little bit of information about Roanoke Island before the battle. 
Prior to the Civil War, um, most African Americans in the U.S. were enslaved. In 1860, Roanoke Island was home to about 590 people, and about 170 of those people were enslaved, almost 30 percent of the population. Here they toiled, they worked as saltwater farmers. So they worked part-time in the fields and as fishermen. The women of the Outer Banks, black and white, freed and enslaved, they would tend nets, they would gather oysters, they would fish alongside their male relatives, and they would shuck scallops. This was based on Algonquian traditions, which utilized lunar tides and currents to increase fish yield. Note that enslaved African-Americans couldn't keep the good fish. They were limited to the trash fish like eels and gar, fish that were bony and unpopular. And a little bit of perspective, um, by 1860, about a sixth of the population of the U.S. was enslaved, so that's around 4 million people. Roughly, that is the same population as the original 13 states in 1776. In the southern slave states, populations of people who were enslaved ranged. So you had some states where they made up to three-fifths of the population, and in North Carolina, those in bondage made up about a third of the population. At 4.30 a.m. on April 12, 1861, Confederate troops fired on Fort Sumter in South Carolina's Charleston Harbor. Less than 34 hours later, Union forces surrendered. So traditionally, that event has been used to mark the beginning of the Civil War. By February 1862, the Civil War had been raging for nearly 10 months and seemed to be favoring the Confederates. So the U.S. targeted the coast of Northern, Car Northern Carolina to gain better traction in the Southern theater and strategically use the many waterways that we have here. Hatteras Island was claimed by the Union. And on February 7th, 1862, General Ambrose Burnside and the Union Army launched an attack on the Confederate controlled Roanoke Island. They were armed with a strategy partially developed by a young man named Thomas Robinson. And um, I would like to give some acknowledgement to a couple of people. Um, the volunteers and the staff at Fort Raleigh National Historic Site, they have scoured first person narratives and primary sources and found actual people who lived in the Roanoke Island Freedmen's Colony. Thomas Robinson is one of those people. When he was 16 years old, he and his brother sought their freedom at Hatteras Island. He had memorized the location of rebel fort positions on the island, and he shared that information with Union officers. His navigational skills, his knowledge of the local waterways were instrumental. They were highly revered by General Burnside. On February 7th, 1862, Thomas Robinson led that army to Ashby Harbor to launch the Battle of Roanoke Island. So we've used historical documents to imagine a silhouette of what these people may have looked like and use those first person narratives to kind of give them their voices back. So Thomas Robinson self-emancipated. He boated down to Hatteras. He promptly told Union officials everything he knew and everything he knew about his enslavers. And that information was instrumental to the battle strategy. There were about 2,500 Confederate soldiers and about 11,500 Union soldiers. So Union victory was swift. By the 8th, fighting had stopped and Roanoke Island was under Union control. This would set the stage for many future campaigns in North Carolina. And um, earlier in the war at Fort Monroe and Hampton Roads, there had been a phrase used, the, brand, the phrase contraband, that was used to prevent enslaved peoples from being returned to their enslavers. The logic was that since property could be confiscated during war, if Southern slave states thought people were property, then we can confiscate people as well. The Union could label enslaved men, women, and children as contraband, and they would gain their freedom when they reached Union lines. The Confiscation Act of 1862 allowed Union officials to seize lands, possession, and enslaved people from disloyal citizens. So after the battle, I have a, um, an engraving here that depicted what it might have looked like, as well as a map of Roanoke Island. After the battle, there were around 200 formerly enslaved men who remained on Roanoke Island, many of whom had been sent there to build those Confederate forts. They were given three choices. You can go back to your families, you can go north, or you can stay here on Roanoke Island. Nearly all of them left to return to their families. No one went north, and only about 27 people stayed. The people who went back had plans to return and bring their families to the safe haven that Roanoke Island had become. So we've learned about a woman named Marie Farabee. She remembered hearing the sound of her mother singing as they worked in the fields. 
They said she was inciting the colored people with her folklore songs. Marie escaped with her mother and sister, and just as they were crossing the sound, they were captured. But her mother thought quickly to rip a piece of her skirt to flag down a Union ship. They saw the signal and brought them to Roanoke Island. And freedom seekers started appearing shortly after the battle ended. Soon hundreds of enslaved men, women, and children from the interior of the state made the journey to the island. They assisted the Union troops in rebuilding the forts, renaming them. And um, they worked on Roanoke and Hatteras Islands, as well as New Bern and other strategic areas in North Carolina. They also served as cooks, as woodcutters, teamsters, longshoremen, carpenters, blacksmiths. Women were employed in doing tasks such as cooking, cleaning for Union officers. Other African-Americans were employed as spies, scouts, and guides, and completed many valuable missions for the Union. By mid-1862, a growing community had started to establish a settlement. The people there used hand tools and the pine trees that grew around the surrounding area to make houses. The first task that everyone completed as a group was to build a place of worship. And after two churches had been constructed, there was a woman named Martha Culling, a formerly enslaved woman, who opened the settlement's first school in a small building on Fork Point near the Union headquarters. This establishment close to Union headquarters, that area was commonly referred to as a contraband camp. Formerly enslaved people were often referred to as contrabands and they were contraband of war according to that Confiscation Act. So with nothing planned, the camp just kind of ran on its own. It was essentially a refugee camp. People took shelter in the old Confederate barracks which may have looked like these here. We don't have photos of the actual Roanoke Islands Freedmen's Colony, so we're just doing our best to find similar places. And with no formal order, there were sanitation issues. Um, they were worried, the military, about those sanitation issues being so close to Union headquarters. And there were no plans for long-term sustenance, long-term shelter, and the military realized they would need to step in. By May of 1863, the population situation was so acute that the federal government seized many of the local lands and then established a formal colony on the island. So on the left, you'll see Chaplain Horace James. He was a 43-year-old Congregationalist minister from Massachusetts. He arrived to Roanoke Island with the Union in February of 1862, and he was known as the Fighting Parson for his service during the battle. He cared for the sick and wounded, and he actually laid out the military cemetery on the island. James was appointed the Superintendent of Blacks in North Carolina. That was his title. And he began the official creation of the Freedmen's Colony in May of 1863. Major General John G. Foster said the following, that Reverend James would settle the colored people on the unoccupied lands and give them agricultural implements and mechanical tools and to train and educate them for a free and independent community. Horace James tried his best to create that free and independent community. He laid out roads. So we have three big broad avenues with several perpendicular streets intersecting. He brought tools, he brought teachers, he bought a sawmill. He hoped that the industry would eventually sustain itself through that sawmill and shad fisheries. Basically, he wanted to create, in his words, a little bit of New England on the Carolina coast. Now, this is Fannie Whitney. Fannie Whitney was enslaved in Hyde County on Judge John Donald's plantation, who was so rich and owned so many slaves that he hardly knew them all. She was married in 1851 to Harry Whitney, and in the fall of 1863, Union troops brought them with their three boys to Roanoke Island. It was there that Harry enlisted, and she never saw him but once after that, when he came to tell her goodbye in her cabin. In January, or by January of 1864, there were 2,700 residents. There were 300 families living in homes they had created themselves. By 1865, there were 3,000 members of the Freedmen's Colony, and at its peak, nearly 3,900 people lived there. The primary goals of the freed people were shelter, worship, and education. On Roanoke Island, the freedmen utilized their skilled knowledge of industrial, agricultural, and marine work to make the colony pretty much self-sustaining. They constructed over 500 buildings, schools, churches, warehouses, workshops, hospitals, and homes, homes of their own. 
This impressive size made the Roanoke Freedmen's Colony one of the largest communities in North Carolina at the time. Um, so unfortunately, the economic growth of the colony, which was on a really good tra trajectory, it slowed considerably when military-aged colonists enlisted in the Union Army and Navy. By 1863, um, thousands of men, women, and children had escaped their lives in bondage for freedom on Roanoke Island. This rapid increase in population created stress not only for the families, but for the soldiers and the environment as well. To help manage the growing influx of residents, Reverend Horace James employed the help of Christian missionaries from the North. These missionaries consisted primarily of single women and they were responsible for educating the residents, mediating between the soldiers and the colonists, and advocating for supplies and funding. One of those missionaries' names was Sarah Freeman. She arrived at Roanoke Island with a group of Northern abolitionist missionaries. She felt that God called her there to serve. Through his grace, she hoped to, think, to teach the refugees to read and write, and then through them, perfect society. There is much destitution and suffering here. I hope we will have the means of survival come winter. Otherwise, many will perish. This at present is the only safe asylum in all North Carolina. Oh, that I could shelter them all. Teachers from the North were sponsored by the American Missionary Association, the AMA, during the war. And they mainly helped the colony through education and charity. A lot of the folks who were coming here only had the clothes on their backs, which very quickly became worn. So clothing, which was required to go to school, was one act of charity. And um, otherwise, delivery of food and goods and rations. The AMA teachers were committed to converting the colonists into evangelical Christianity through biblical scripture. And they wanted to kind of embed this idea that education was freedom. Education would allow people to reach their full potential and become independent. There was very much an idea of imposing this New England culture on the members of the Roanoke Island Freedmen's Colony and to pursue teaching them the values of thrift, uh, the values of hard work, that through hard work, you could gain your independence. The schoolhouse walls were decorated with quotes such as, this school is for the free, his people are free, and a day or an hour of virtuous liberty is worth a whole eternity of bondage. Another organization involved was the National Freedmen's Relief Association, the NFRA, and their focus really shifted from that religion and charity to actual skills, skill-based education, self-sustaining skills. So women were taught to sew, knit, straw braid, and quilt. In addition, the NFRA hired black teachers, which were not able to be hired by the AMA, and among those hired was Martha Culling, the woman who established that first all black school on the island. And she had actually been teaching before the Northern teachers arrived. This young man's name is London Farabee. He had to undergo many hardships like all young slave children had to, uh, to suffer. He was taken from his mother when he was quite young and only got to see her twice before she died. He suffered under the yoke of oppression until August 1861, when he ran away and reached Yankee Lions about 30 minutes before his master. He entered school on Roanoke Island in spring of 1864, where his progress was so rapid, no scholar in the school or on the island could compete with me. So for these newly self-emancipated men, women, and children of color entering the Freedmen's Colony, education was of the utmost importance. While they were enslaved, it was illegal to learn how to read or write, and individuals who were caught teaching these skills faced very severe punishment. According to North Carolina slave codes, any enslaved person caught teaching another how to read or write faced 39 lashes on his or her bare back. While we don't have photos of the Roanoke Island Freedmen's Colony Schools. We do have these depictions, including this one from James's Plantation School in Avon Hill in Pitt County. So this is what the Freedmen's Colony Schools on Roanoke Island may have looked like. You'll notice that everyone is dressed. You had to have clothes, you had to have shoes in order to come to school. And the missionaries created quite an orderly atmosphere. There was no talking, no whispering, mainly reading from the Bible. And the Roanoke Island Freedmen's Colony was home to 10 schools and 33 teachers, but they didn't all operate at the same time. 
During its peak, the colony had five schools offering education to adults and children. Those missionaries were the only educators. And with limited funds, all they had to use for their lessons was the Bible. Classes were held throughout the day, so children attended in the morning, women attended in the afternoon, and men attended at night after they'd finished the day's labors. His name is Spencer Gallup, and we found some really wonderful quotes from Mr. Gallup. He belonged to a man by the name of Hodges Gallup at Currituck, North Carolina, before the war and worked on a farm. He escaped to Roanoke Island after the battle in 1862 and cut wood and helped build forts for the Yankees. He was only 19 years old when he enlisted in June 1863 in the 36th United States Colored Troops Company A. Their first duty was guarding the prisoner of war camp at Point Lookout, Maryland, where some of their former enslavers were kept. On January 1st, 1863, as part of the Emancipation Proclamation, President Abraham Lincoln freed all enslaved persons in most Confederate-held areas. This, coupled with the Militia Act, opened the way for African-American men to join the U.S. Army. By May of 1863, African-American regiments began to form, and recruiters were dispatched to southern states to raise Union regiments along the self-liberated people of color. On Roanoke Island, over 150 men rushed to enlist, primarily in four regiments, the 35th Infantry, 1st North Carolina Colored Volunteers, the 36th Infantry, 2nd North Carolina Colored Volunteers, the 37th Infantry, 3rd North Carolina Volunteers, and the 14th Colored Heavy Artillery Regiment. So now, most of the men are gone. Women had to take on roles as heads of household. Education was no longer a priority. Women had to stay home. They had to cut wood, collect wood, make fires for warmth or build houses. Some of them still worked as cooks, as maids, as laundresses, and then came home and performed those exact same tasks for their family. Children were sent in line to wait for rations three to four times a day since the people remaining on the island most likely would not be able to sustain themselves. So these children would spend all day in line and some would be sent home empty handed. Many also took on odd jobs to help meet their family needs. This was a very challenging time for the colony. The men had been promised income and saw none. Their families received no rations. This lack of military aged men meant that much of the Freedmen's colony infrastructure such as that sawmill and the shad fisheries suffered greatly. Because of this, the once successful colony soon became an overcrowded refugee camp again. Freedom seekers continued to settle, they continued to pour in. And by the summer of 1864, the camp's population swelled to 3,900. That's larger than the population of Charlotte, North Carolina in 1860. This is a engraving we found of um, issuing rations to the old and sick from a sketch. And after the Civil War was over, the trials persisted. President Andrew Johnson issued the Amnesty Proclamation, which allowed those former landowners to reclaim their land if they could prove ownership and allegiance to the government. The colonists were encouraged to leave. They were encouraged to find work on the mainland, but many were reluctant to do so because they had heard stories of former slaves being mistreated or even killed. They were also afraid they wouldn't be able to find work. A lot of Previous slave owners didn't want to pay anyone for work. They couldn't afford it either. There was a massive miscommunication as Horace James and the colonists were under the impression that the land that they settled on had been given to them. That was untrue. As the owners increasingly reclaimed their land and rations were continuously being reduced, the freed people, they faced starvation. Many were sick and many died. There was a winter season ahead that only intensified those circumstances. The future on Roanoke was unpromising. This is Jim Banks. Jim's mother was sold away from him and he was sent to Roanoke Island. He didn't know how old he was, but his teacher said he looked to be about six years old. He can pull weeds and grass for pigs right smart and hold the calves while they milk the cows. He was one of hundreds of orphans at the Freedmen's Colony, most of whom were homeless. The teachers hoped an orphanage would be built before winter, but it never was. 
the land on which they played, they planned the orphanage to be was eventually given back to its former owner. So by 1866, there is no military need for the colony anymore. And the black residents were gradually forced to vacate the colony um, via cut rations, free transportation out of there, and eventually official orders. The schools were broken up, the teachers were relocated. The warehouses and other the support buildings that had been built by the freed people were sold to the locals at reduced rates. And some of the landowners who reacquired their lands destroyed the buildings, the houses that the freed people had built, they burned them. By 1867, the colony only had 950 residents to go from 3,900 to 950. Eventually the colony just broke apart. Most people returned to their previous home areas, such as Coin Jock, Elizabeth City, Edenton, Plymouth, while the others remained on the island. And although the colony as a group did not succeed, their time in Roanoke was not in vain. For the first time ever, they had control over their labor. They had received an education. They carried with them the skills and knowledge to their next destinations. And today their descendants have reached financial independence. They've purchased real estate. They've established businesses. Roanoke Island was only the beginning. Locally, 11 African-Americans banded together. They pooled their resources and they bought 200 acres of land to just make their own village on Roanoke Island. That community still exists today. It's the California neighborhood of Mantia. So I've introduced you to all these people. And um, again, I want to thank the volunteers, the staff, um, the Pea Island Preservation Society, who has helped us unearth these people and give them back their names and their stories. And I want to tell you what happened to them. So Marie Farabee's mother encouraged her daughter's schooling. Both would graduate college in 1870, 1875 alongside Booker T. Washington. Then Marie moved to, to Brooklyn, New York, where she taught school, married, and raised a large family. Marie died at the age of 96 in 1956. Thomas Robinson's support in the Battle of Roanoke Island was never forgotten by General Ambrose Burnside. He would stay with Burnside as a paid servant and was later observed to be reading a school book at every leisure moment. We do not know what happened to him after that. London Farabee actually moved to New Bern and continued his education. He later studied to be a preacher with the AME Church and would work at churches in Winston and Greenville County. He rose to the rank of parish elder before his death. Sarah Freeman, the missionary, left Roanoke Island in 1866 with young Jim Banks, and together they would move to Indianapolis, Indiana, where she continued teaching African Americans. She died in 1893. Even after those challenges that she faced on Roanoke Island, she remained committed to her cause. Spencer Gallup with the USCT survived his term. He fought at Newmarket Heights and was mustered out in 1866 at Brazos Santiago in Texas. He returned home to Hertford, North Carolina, where he continued farming his own land. He died in 1917. Fanny Whitney applied for a widow's pension in 1867 after her husband Harry died. This began a lifelong struggle, a lifelong journey of proving her marriage and her children's paternity and staving off pretenders to her pension. She was successful and she passed away in 1911. Jimmy Banks is considered one of the fortunate orphan children of the colony. He would travel to Indianapolis with Sarah P. Freeman. And although he disappears from history after this, he's just one of the many freedmen on Roanoke Island who strove for a better life. Um, and again, acknowledgments to a lot of this information has come from a book by um, Patricia Click called Time Before Trial. And a lot more information has come from the tireless efforts of the volunteers and staff at Fort Raleigh National Historic Site to determine who these people were, to find those primary resources, to find the letters they've written, to find everything they could about folks just to give them their voices. Now, I thank y'all so much for your time. If you have any questions, I'd love to sit and answer them. Thank you so much. Yes.
Um, so a, a common name you might hear about is Richard Etheridge, who was enslaved on Roanoke Island and then eventually became a Pea Island lifesaver. He actually, um, as part of this Freedmen's Colony, wrote several letters that eventually made their way to, I believe, the president um, talking about the quality of conditions on the island. Um, but then as far as the people who were actually enslaved on Roanoke Island, we don't have many of their names, no, much less the history of what happened to them. Good question. Yes. Because of its, because it was separated by water, first of all, um, it gave Roanoke Island a very, very um, advantageous position, but simply because it was captured by the Union, that people could come there and be free. As the Union helped and Hatteras as well. Thank you. Well, thank you. for coming out and thank you for our guests for coming out today and invite you to join us again on March the 6th. Thank you. Thank you so much.